welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Today we're going to carry on with our session about gallium arsenide lenses. Now in the last session we saw that a one and a half inch gallium arsenide lens had some really strange properties. It looked as though there was a focal point buried underneath the existing focal point, maybe five millimetres down below the focal point. Are we going to see the same sort of characteristic or properties when we test a two inch and a two and a half inch? Now as I was editing the last video, it did cross my mind that I was using MDF as a means of finding the focal point for this lens. I wondered whether, in fact, I should be using acrylic because, hey, that was the material that I was testing. So what I've done is to very quickly run the same sorts of tests again with acrylic. And let's just have a quick look. Last session we were using this 38 millimeter lens and we set it up like this. So it had a 28 millimeter gap. I changed it to 24 millimeters so that we could carry out this focus test. And sure enough, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28 is the thinnest line. So the focus came out absolutely spot on. But when we did the penetration tests, maybe if I'd have done my focus test on acrylic, it would have come out differently. Did I get it wrong with the focus? We're going to carry out this focus test at various speeds and powers to see if we can get an idea of what's happening to the focus. The first test is what we were using originally, which is 15% power. This time we're going to speed up to 200 millimeters a second, which is engraving speed. And I'm purposely overlapping the test with the edge so that I can see the depth of cut as it runs onto the edge. We'll look at these under the microscope in a minute. 15%, 200 millimetres a second. So that's 15% at 20 millimetres a second. So that's 99% at 20 millimetres a second. Right, so we're going to go really slow now with 100% power. I don't think we shall burn right through, but we might get pretty close. We need to go and have a look at those results <coughs> under the microscope to see if we can work out what on earth is going on. Perhaps this will give us some clues as to where the focal point is on this lens. So here's our standard test at 15% power and 20 millimeters a second. So if you remember we set it up to 24, 24, 25, 26, 27, plus the 10 that was buried inside the lens, which is 37 millimeter focus. And then it starts going out of focus again. Okay, now let's see what happens when we run at 200 millimeters a second. You can hardly see it here, but there is a very faint line here because the beam is four millimeters out of focus into the material. So that's 24, 25, 26. We've just got a little bit of a hump there. And then 27 looks as though we've got more. And let's see what 28 is like. Twenty-eight looks as though it's getting shallower again, and twenty-nine has nearly disappeared. So again, at two hundred millimeters a second, at twenty-seven millimeters, we've still got the same intensity focus point. I mean, the actual intensity is a lot less because we've run faster, and the power has been spread out more. This is twenty millimeters a second, but a hundred percent power, maximum power. Now you can see here we've now achieved the best focus. We First of all, we've got a very narrow cut. And secondly, we've got quite a deep cut. You can see that that cut is deeper than this one. 24, 25, 26, 27. The actual position where the intensity of the focus has not changed, it's remained at 27 millimeters. 
and then it starts disappearing again and getting bigger and bigger and bigger as we go past the focal point and start drawing the beam out. This is what's happening after the focal point. You can see it's growing pretty quickly. So now we've slowed the beam right down. There's no obvious focus detectable by the depth of cut. We're running very, very slowly now at five millimeters a second with 100% power. And we're seeing the same sort of effect that we saw with our spike test. Look, we've got powerful beams coming in here which are passing through what looks like a focal point here at maybe two or three millimetres into the job. Now, as we raise the focal point up, we can see that we're also raising this focal point up as well to probably close to one millimetre. And we're getting a wider neck. We're getting slightly less erosion on the inside here. And then here, we're nearly got the focus right out to the surface again. And as we put the focus out to the surface, we've got a little bit less erosion on the inside. Minimum intensity at the surface is occurring just here. That's the smallest net beam intensity. And here, we're starting to get bigger again. As the beam moves out, this is what's happening below the focal point. It's getting very messy. 24, 25, 26, 27 millimetres is still the smallest entry point. So it appears that speed or power does not change the effective intensity focus. It remains at approximately the same distance away from the lens. Well, time is passing and I'm sure I'm getting greyer since the last time I spoke to you. A few days have passed and I've been puzzling over these little test pieces that we made. Now, since we checked that the focal point for this material appears to be 37 millimeters and not 38 millimeters as per the lens focal point, um, I've been back and I've redone these little tests, setting the focal point on the surface at 37 millimeters and also five millimeters into the surface as well so that I've got some comparisons because I've got tremendous faith in this material, acrylic. Just like a young child that doesn't know how to lie, this is exactly the same. It's going to tell me what's going on. Although this stuff doesn't tell lies, sometimes it's difficult to read what it's actually saying. One of the puzzles that I'm trying to solve is what is this ballooning effect that happens inside here. It doesn't happen inside a four inch lens, but it is definitely happening inside this one and a half inch lens. Several possibilities exist. I think that it's most likely sideways beams coming in and crossing over and scouring out. Beams that are very, very slightly off axis. But on the other hand, it's been suggested to me that it's probably scouring caused by heated gases inside the enclosed tube. If the gas is getting that hot inside there, then it's certainly a viable proposition that we could be heating the gas up and that gas, the longer it exists in that tube, could be scouring away the inside of the tube, away from what the effects of the laser beam actually are. And I think I found a way of testing and solving that problem. Now, I'm not gonna bore you with all the details. I've set all the machine up manually so that I've got a 300 millisecond pulse and it's been set 37 millimeters above the surface. So each one of these little marks along here has been done at the focal point on the surface. Okay, and then what we're trying to do is to analyze what's happened to each one of these. You said, but they're all the same. Well, no, they're not, because what I've done, I've started off maybe two millimeters inside the edge of the material, and I've skewed the material so that as I step across the material, I'm going to start scanning down 
and at some stage, and I didn't know at which stage, I'm going to start producing half a hole. And that will tell me whether or not what we're seeing is a trapped gas situation. And we need to go and look at that under the microscope to get the answer to that question. Now there's the view that the laser beam sees. And as you can see, we've pierced into the top there and we're gradually creeping towards the edge of the material because I set the piece of material across at an angle. Well, we can clearly see that all these are exactly the same. And then if I change the light a little bit, what we've got, the neck just in here is within the material and then it breaks out of the material just here. So there is no possibility of captive gases in this column here. And yet it's still ballooned. And this last one, which is a perfect section, is still showing all the signs of that ballooning. So it must be rays that are almost parallel to the axis of the beam that are coming in here and scouring away the edge of this. So that's one problem solved. But now what I've got to do is to try and decode what the rest of these pipes are telling me. So I've got a lot of thinking and some, I think some CAD work to do some ray tracing to see if I can establish what might be happening. I've done the focus test and on acrylic it says the best focus is 37 mil. We've got the gap set to 22, which is equivalent to 32 millimeter focal distance. So the focus is actually five millimeters into the material at the start of the test. The flat side down is consistently cutting shallower than the flat side up. The next test that we're going to do is something that I call a speed test because this is an important test to try and find out how deep and how fast a lens can cut. At the moment we've been interested in mainly depth but here what we're doing we're using two milliseconds, four milliseconds, six milliseconds etc to see how quickly we can pulse into this material. In other words, this will give us an idea of the cutting speed performance of a lens. Now, before I've tried to reverse engineer what's happening to the rays, I've done eight tests. Two for each of the lenses that I've got. One has been with the lens flat side up and the other with the lens flat side down. Now while I had the lenses in position, I did another test for every lens. That was to try and determine the speed of cutting of each lens. Because the speed of penetration is in fact the speed of cutting. So what we've got here is two milliseconds, four, six, eight, ten, all the way up here we've got a little bit of a trace of how quickly the cutting develops in each one of these lenses whether it be face down or face up they're all down the side here flats up flat down again something that we've proved before is that this orange which is the two and a half inch is definitely one of those that's going to carry on going up there and is responsible for deep cutting this pink one here, which is a 50.8, a two inch flat side up, may also perform pretty well, according to this prediction. The other advantage of this two inch lens is if you look here, the rate at which it climbs extremely quickly here at somewhere in the region of about three milliseconds for a three millimeter thick piece of acrylic. So what that really means is that if we've got a 0.2 kerf, the diameter of the beam is say 0.2. That means that in a one millimeter length of cut, I've assumed that I've got these all joined up and I've got one, two, three, four, five cuts per millimeter. In other words, I've got five cuts at four milliseconds a cut, 
which gives me 20 milliseconds to cut one millimetre. Now there's a thousand milliseconds in a second and 20 milliseconds to cut one millimetre. Divide those two and what you get is a cutting speed of 50 millimetres a second. Can I cut three millimetre acrylic at 50 millimetres a second? I don't know. That's what the facts tell me. So it may well be marginally less than that. I think we experimented like this before and we found that maybe we had something like about 0.8 of that value. But it's still a way of trying to assess how efficiently you can cut with different lenses. Well, the cutting speed test was just an interesting diversion because I had the lenses in place and it was easy enough to do the test. But the real task for this session was to try and see if there's any way that I can decode what's happening in these tubes. So we've got five millimetres into the material, four, three, two, one. That's supposedly the focal point. And then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight millimetres below the focal point. And the further we drop below the focal point, you see the beam is becoming very blunt and it does not penetrate very much into the, into the material. So decoding these is my next task. Now, as I said to you maybe in the last session, the biggest problem I've got is trying to decode and decide whether or not these are the result of a focus, which is below the focal point, or whether these are the result of a mode burn. I must remind yourself and me of something that I did several months ago. And that was this mode burn test under two different circumstances. The first circumstance was a parallel beam straight out the laser and burning into this material. This is not a focus point. This point happens because I've got high intensity at the centre of the beam and low intensity at the edge of the beam. And if I give it enough time, and in this case it was 10 seconds, the centre of the beam burns in faster than the edge of the beam. Hence I get this conical shape. Now this more slender conical shape happened in three seconds as opposed to 10 seconds because I had interposed a long focus lens into the beam and reduced the beam diameter before it hit the edge of the block. Now that basically increased the I suppose the energy density or what I prefer to call the intensity of the light before it hit this piece of acrylic and higher intensity light means faster damage so if you allow intense light to hit this it will penetrate faster than the less intense light so we finish up with the same result a pointed beam but look this pointed beam has got nothing to do with the focus of the actual lens path itself. So we mustn't be confused between these two issues. That is not a focus point. That is a point caused by very high intensity and an exposure time. The low intensity here is doing very little damage and the high intensity is doing much more damage. What we are now trying to do with the analysis of these tubes, we're trying to move further and further down the beam and we're taking samples at various points across the beam and we're getting different, more intense mode burns. If I go past the focal point, then the mode burn is going to change dramatically. The only problem is these lenses do not have a single focal point and that causes all sorts of problems in trying to analyze it. I feel as though I'm reading tea leaves trying to analyze or reverse engineer these rays. So I need some additional information and I'm doing that with this piece of card. So I've got my four inch or 101 millimeter lens in here and here I've got a 61 millimeter spacer. I'm 40 millimeters below the focal point at the moment. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to burn some marks in this paper at five millimeter intervals. 
Now you will see that there are a whole load of holes in that card. Now every one of those holes, because the card is a piece of constant thickness material and the power is constant, the holes will be created by the same intensity of light. So that will tell me basically what the intensity is at various positions along the beam. And that maybe helped me to determine uh, some of the tracks of the rays. Now here we've got a little fixture that I've made for testing the focal lengths of my lenses. And I've set up a target in here, which I'm going to move backwards and forwards. And I'm get, going to get you to look at that target through this two inch zinc selenide lens that I've put in here. Right, so I've got the two inch lens roughly in focus now. And as I move the target towards the lens, only by a millimeter, it's already gone out of focus. So let's put it back into focus and take it a millimeter out of focus. And this is very much in accordance with standard lens theory. You have a very short focal range over which a lens works. Now, the other thing that's interesting about this image, where's all that red and orangey stuff coming from around the edge of the image? So unlike this camera, which has got a very good set of optics, which focuses perfectly on the surface, the lens that we're using here has got something called spherical aberration. And even as I hold it in front of this target, you can see how it's actually producing this strange orange glow around the outside, which is the spherical aberration. The problem is we're looking at this in white uniform light. Now standard lens theory works well for cameras, as you can see, telescopes, microscopes, projectors, because they all rely on uniform light. Now I know there might be different brightnesses and colours in a projected image, but that's not quite the same as the intensity problem that we face with a laser beam. We are not trying to focus images. We are trying to focus light intensity. And that's a completely different subject, which is not really covered by lens theory. Now in the, in the description text below this video, you'll find some links to some other YouTube videos where people are trying to link standard lens theory into laser cutting technology. Now one particular video I would love you to look at is this by a moderately famous company. Now you would think that these would be professional enough to explain correctly and technically what's going on. Here what they're trying to describe is that a four inch lens is to blame for this loss of text down here. But hang about that implies that a lens has got some intelligence and it knows when to transmit light and when not to transmit light. It's been perfectly okay transmitting light here and burning these parts of the text. So why is the four inch lens to blame for this missing text down here? In reality, it's nothing to do with the lens at all. It's all to do with the light signals that are coming from their machine. If there are no signals, the lens cannot make light happen. It's all to do with the parameters that they have their machine set to. They are not transmitting every single pixel that's in this bitmap image. And these are actually missing pixels. It's not the fault of the lens that the pixel is not there. It's the fault of the encoding that the light is not there to be transmitted by the four inch lens. Now this four inch lens looks half reasonable. It's not doing a bad job around the edge. It's not blobby and lumpy around the edge. Even here, look, it's not really blobby and lumpy, right? But the verticals are missing because they're not scanning the correct pixels. What I'm saying is there's a great deal of misinformation out there about lenses. 
how they work, people just don't understand how lenses and laser systems work together. So go and have a look at the video links that I've provided and you'll see what the current understanding of lenses is. You might want to do that before you push on with the rest of my video that shows you how lenses actually cut. Now, as you can see, I've already done some CAD work and that CAD work has allowed me to uh, work out the essence of how a laser beam actually cuts. In other words, it's the interaction between the laser beam and the lens that produces these strange effects that I've been looking for. And after two years of searching, I think I've now uncovered a model that actually describes how and why a laser beam cuts in the way that it does. My basic principle of a spiky focus below the focal point has not proved to be wrong. It's just proved to be the wrong way of looking at the problem. The first thing we must do is quickly go back over the basic principle of a Gaussian distribution curve. Now, I know that my beam is approximately 12 millimetres diameter. You've seen me burning tape for longer and longer periods to try and work out exactly what the maximum diameter of my beam is, because obviously when we get right down here to the bottom tail of this intensity, it takes a long time for that very low intensity to damage the tape. Okay, well this central middle third of the beam, which in this case represents uh, four millimeters, so that central four millimeters contains roughly 70% of the power of the beam because the area under this curve represents 100% of the power of my beam, 70 watts. So therefore this central 70% power is roughly equivalent to 50 watts. So in this four millimeters, the yellow four millimeter section, I've got 50 watts of power being used. That 50 watts is not being used as watts. We are using those watts to develop intensity. And the shape of this curve is very important. And a proper Gaussian curve means that at my 50 watt extremity here, my 50 watts in the center here is developing 62% intensity within the beam. And as I get closer to the center of the beam, my intensity starts going up. And so this red zone here, which is actually one sixth of the diameter of the beam, two millimeters, contains roughly 89% of the intensity available in this Gaussian distribution. Right at the center here, we've got 100%. Okay, so you mustn't lose sight of the fact that it's intensity that does damage. The intensity of the naked beam is vital because if you've got a substandard Gaussian distribution here, and let's just say that it's a very flat distribution, as they say in computing terms, rubbish in, rubbish out. Okay, so don't expect the performance that you, you see me getting from your laser beam if it doesn't look like a good Gaussian distribution beam. I'm very lucky that I've got a superb quality beam. My rays, if you like, are coloured to represent intensity boundaries within the beam itself. So this represents 0% intensity right at the extreme here because there is no power there. There is a boundary, sort of. But then here, 13% intensity boundary. Then we've got our 62% intensity boundary. And here we've got our 89 or 90% intensity boundary. So most of the intensity is passing right through this red zone at the center here. This Gaussian distribution exists here in the naked beam, but it doesn't last for very long. I always thought that that was going to be compressed down to a very small version of it just here at the focal point. That's what I've believed all the way along. In other words, if you turn a telescope round, you see a small version of the moon when you look at the moon. You don't see some distorted version of the moon or a white blob. That's not the case 
with this shape here, when we start amplifying it down to here, it's no longer Gaussian at this point here, and it's totally destroyed when we get here. But we'll talk further about that in a few moments when we've looked at more detail in this diagram. So when we did this test, if you remember, we set the table at this height here, okay, and we did this first burn. Now this first burn, the focal point was buried five millimetres into the material. And then we dropped the table by a millimetre, and now it's four millimetres into the material. We dropped it, dropped it, dropped it, and eventually, by the time we got to line number five here, we were at, supposedly, the focal point, which is what this blue line is. And what I've then done is to measure the diameter, the entry hole damage on each one of these test spikes. And that's what these red circles are, the damage at the entrance to each one of these holes. We can't get damage unless there's light intensity there to excite the molecules up above their vaporization point and make them disappear. So these diameters here are very exact markers of light intensity. That's what I placed into my diagram first. I then realized that I was having quite a bit of difficulty trying to work out how my rays were actually passing through these various points. Couldn't make a lot of sense of them. And it was at that point that I decided I had to go back and use something that I'd used several years ago to plot what I caught, what I then called energy density within the beam. And that's what some people call it. But I would much prefer to use the term light intensity, not energy density because it is light intensity which is causing the damage to the material. It's the thing that's inciting the molecules, making the molecules vibrate faster, and faster vibrating molecules get hotter, and the hotter they get, we see it as burning. But in fact, what it's doing, it's getting the molecules vibrating so fast that the molecular bonds start breaking down and we get chemical changes. And that's what you're witnessing here. You're witnessing chemical changes to the material as it heats up, as it vibrates faster. And we're getting a combination of oxygen in the air, which is beginning to oxidize some of the material away. And we're leaving some carbon behind, which is the black stuff. We've got two materials involved here. The red, the red circles are these spikes which are disappearing and being created at 200 degrees C. At 200 degrees C acrylic evaporates and what we're left with is nothing. We're left with an edge. So what's inside that edge must have evaporated and gone above 200 degrees C to disappear. So we've got basically a an intensity boundary that we're setting with these red circles, light intensity boundary. Now we're doing exactly the same thing here. And what in this instance we've got, we've got two intensity boundaries that we can look at. First of all, we've got a hole in the center, and I hope you might be able to see those, see the light through those holes there. But we've got holes through the center of these black dots. Now those holes can only exist because we have made the material evaporate. We've burnt it. We've made the molecules shake so hard that they've destroyed themselves and disappeared somewhere. This card is basically wood pulp. And wood has got some very strange properties when it comes to, let's call it self-destruction. You would like to see it as burning, but I like to think of it as self-destruction because of stimulation by light. This self-destruction happens in three basic stages. Number one, you've got cellulose. And the cellulose disappears at about 250 to 300 degrees C. What's then left is the cell structure of the cellulose, the cellular walls, a material called lignin, which shakes itself to pieces and disappears at about 350 degrees C. 
And then what we're left with is this black stuff. And everybody knows what that black stuff is, it's carbon. But what is going to surprise some people is that that black stuff doesn't shake itself to pieces until 5,000 degrees C. It boils at about 3,500 degrees C, but it disappears to gas at about 5,000 degrees C. Now on the way up to 5,000 degrees C, it may well combine with other elements, mainly oxygen in the air, and it will produce carbon dioxide gas and carbon monoxide gas. But any carbon that's left has to exceed about 5,000 degrees C before it will disappear. So there's a very good marker of high intensity in this card. But there's also another marker in this card as well, which is the outer brown mark. What I want to do now is to take a look at this particular focal point here, because that is a vital point that helped me to construct these diagrams. And I say these diagrams because I've done one of these diagrams for each of the four lenses that I have. We'll just take a look at the uh, the first hole on here, which has got a, a burn around the outside of the hole. Now, you can clearly see the hole itself here, but you would ask yourself the question, why is this not black? I mean, look, you can clearly see the clear card and the paper underneath, and yet we've got lots of carbon around the outside and in the centre here, and we've got lots of scorching around here. Well, this black carbonaceous material combined with the white gives the impression when you mix it in your eye that this is a brown material, a scorched material, and you get various shades of scorching as you move out from the centre of this hole. Now this card is not quite what it seems, it's not simple wood pulp. About 20% of this card is something called kaolin, china clay. And china clay is used widely in the paper industry and the card industry to A, stiffen the card, B, to make it a slightly glossier, harder finish so that you can write on it and it doesn't soak the ink into the paper. So kaolin is in itself a mineral material which does not burn. When I say it doesn't burn, it melts at around about mm, 1700 degrees C and probably by the time it gets to two and a half or three thousand degrees C it will vaporize but it's nowhere near the vaporization temperature of this stuff which is the carbon so we've got a huge range of temperatures going on as this material destroys itself this brown which is not evaporating and it's not turning to carbon, but it's just scorching. So we've got two light intensity boundaries when we look at these pictures. So as the beam gets more condensed, we're getting a different pattern of burning. And then we get to this rather strange one here, which I said is very strange because you can see not only have we got our total evaporation of material in the center here, We've also got a slightly brown halo round here. And then we've got no damage at all. And then we've got a reoccurrence of our brown halo around here. We've got equal boundaries of intense light intensity at these points. So again, these are very important markers that tell us what is going on within the beam. This one is getting close to the focal point. We've got total destruction in the middle here where the material is shaking itself to pieces. We've got partial destruction here around this boundary. And then right around the outside, we've got virtually no destruction. You can just see a hint of brown around here where there's obviously some very light energy around the outside. But basically we've got a, an intensity boundary here, which is very obvious. Now the focal point is very interesting. So we've got a very heavy layer of carbon just round here, indicating we've had very high temperature there, but not enough to make it disappear. And then we've got our thin layer around the outside here of brown. But you'll notice that the brown and this destruction are very close together now. 
intensity beams are all converging on this one point that people recognize as the focal point. It's not a focal point because if it was a focal point, we would not have any of this brown around the outside. We would just have total destruction because all the rays would be passing through that hole. Most of the rays are passing through that hole, but some of the rays are still not passing through the hole. So this represents effectively the size of the focal point, not this. So the next part of this picture that I'd like you to understand are these green circles, which represent the brown extremity of the scorch layer and the white circles, which represent the total internal destruction of the material, i.e. a hole. Now this card pattern of Burns was crucial to helping me define where the focal point for the lens really is. Because remember what I said to you, a focal point is the point through which all the rays pass. And so the smallest hole that I could find, and let's just zoom in, you'll see that what I've been able to do, I've been able to concentrate my yellow rays, my red rays, my blue rays onto this hole here, because this is where all the power is hitting to cause that amount of damage. That must be the point of maximum intensity, that white circle. Okay. Now there are some other things happening around the outside here, which are going to cause scorching. Okay. Now remember this white beam, although it's got virtually no power in it at all, because it's the extremity of zero, there is still some small amount of power there to do damage. So combine the white with the blue and the yellow and even the red. And we're going to get this very, very small scorch boundary around the focal point. But this focal point basically defines where I've got to make all my beams pass very close to it and by it. And it was this key feature, the focal point on card, which has allowed me to, if you like, project and guess where the various intensity of rays are passing through this focal point. So now we can start looking at them in a slightly different way. Now what I've done here is to strip away all the useless data that was very useful for constructing this diagram so that we can see what's actually happening. And if we look carefully, you'll see that the outer rays are crossing over here the next ray, the next ones in, which are the blue rays, are crossing over here beyond the focal point, and the yellow rays are crossing over even further beyond the focal point, and eventually the red rays are crossing over beyond the focal point. So there is no single focal point. If there is any sort of focal point, this has got the maximum amount of power, the reds, so that should technically be the focal point, but it turns out not to be, because there is a strange set of circumstances that exists just here. And you think, well, hang on, there must be power down here, because this is the focal point. That isn't the way it works, I'm afraid. That's why I said my focal point idea was both correct and incorrect. There is a spike of focus way beyond the focal point, but it's not that spike of focus which is causing the damage. Let me try and explain that because this is a very difficult concept and I'm going to work back in a very simple way to start with. Remember what I said to you, the area under the curve equals 70 watts. They're all Gaussian distribution curves, but they have got different baselines. As I shrink the baseline, so the intensity within the beam goes up. So you remember back to my picture of the two mode burns that I did, one with parallel beam and one with a focusing beam. Well, here we've got a focusing beam. Okay, and if I take this shape here, so let's just assume that this is a section through the beam and it's obviously above the focal point. But what's going to happen then? We're going to get a mode burn and the mode burn will be intensity times time. 
So we should be able to burn quite a deep hole quite quickly. So as you can see, this one has got substantially more intensity than that one because I've got a slightly smaller baseline. As you can see, I've only moved a very small amount down the beam, but now what I've got, I've got a, a tremendously increased intensity. And if we take a look, you'll see that that intensity is not spreading out here. That intensity starts here at the focal point, which is say 0.2, and very quickly bores its way in, leaving a 0.2 diameter hole behind, because that's where it's eventually going to grow to. Now you'll remember when we do a normal mode burn, we've got parallel rays of light hitting the surface here. And it is the high intensity rays that are in the center of the beam that are actually working their way in quicker and quicker to make this point. Whereas the low in, lower intensity rays at the outside are doing less damage. But the high energy in the center doesn't change because the rays are parallel. That isn't the case here. Because as we start nibbling away into here with our erosion, look what's happening. We've got yellow rays, which are adding into the equation. We've got the red rays, which are actually still compressing down, and they are actually increasing the intensity of the light even more. And then we've got the blue rays, which affect to a certain extent, and then they stop working. So we've got a very complex rate of erosion taking place within this orange spike of potential intensity. That intensity is not constant. That's really what I'm saying. So we will actually be not working with a proper Gaussian spike of energy here as I've shown it. This will be a really strange distorted spike of energy. I do not have the mental capability to be able to analyze all these variables and tell you exactly what's going to happen. I can tell you in essence what's going to happen and I've broken down the elements to show you the essence of what's going to happen. Now I've done exactly the same drawing for all four of the lenses and what I've done I've put the focal points all in line so that you can clearly see that as the focal distance of a lens changes the red high intensity focal point moves further and further beyond the lens's natural focal point which is why we can cut thick material with the longer focal length. So although this one and a half inch has got a much smaller focal point, it may well have a much higher intensity, but its core, its red core, if you like, of power, does not project as far as the four inch one. The four inch one intensity beam is lower because it's a bigger diameter, but if you put more time into it, in other words, you cut slower, you will be able to cut deeper. You will never be able to cut deep with a one and a half inch lens. Although it has got a lot of intensity, it does not have the potential to cut deep because its focal point disappears in a much shorter distance. So all this energy density at the focal point is meaningless. First of all, as I've indicated before, there isn't such a thing as an energy density at the focal point. There can only be, <clears throat> that can only be a nominal energy density. And that doesn't describe the model that we see here. We don't have an average density across the focal point. It's a Gaussian distribution of some sort but a distorted Gaussian distribution because we do not have all the beams perfectly lined up. If we had the perfect lens, would we be able to cut with it? That's an interesting question. And I would think it would be very poor at cutting. The only reason these lenses cut is because we've got this variation, this aberration, because it's a property of a spherical shaped lens. So my point really is no matter how good 
you make a spherical lens, it can be as perfect as possible, but it will still have this weakness of aberration, which is the one thing that we need for cutting. Yeah. I'm absolutely sure that there'll be many people on the other side of this camera lens that will not accept the fact that, hey, we need this aberration to make a lens cut. I've even doubted it myself. All these diagrams are actually wrong, technically, because this parallel beam will refract at an angle inside this material and then have another refractive path when it comes out of the material. So this is a very simplistic diagram, but it describes what actually happens, which is this confusion of focal points as I have described to you in the previous parts of the video. Now we can get rid of this confusion and we can try and get a perfect focal point with something called an aspheric lens, which you can see has got a weird shape. And again, the paths through that lens are not technically correct, but the end result is more or less correct. In other words, we shall be able to produce with some very special distortions, a perfect focal point. Now, I believe that that perfect focal point will not allow us to do anything other than engrave. Secondly, we cannot get hold of any of these lenses to prove the point. They're very expensive and they're not typically available for our little Chinese machines. So we have to suffer with either this type of lens, which always has spherical aberration and is great for cutting, or there is an attempt to try and reduce this problem with something called a meniscus lens. A meniscus lens has got a spherical surface on the outside and it's got a secondary spherical surface underneath the lens to try and correct for this problem here. Although you can't see it in great detail, this is not a perfect focal point. This still has some aberration on it because we've got two spherical surfaces. The second spherical surface attempts to remove the major part of the top surface spherical aberration, but it doesn't succeed completely. So this lens will cut because it's not perfect, but it won't cut as well as this lens. You don't believe me? Let me show you something. Now, what we've got here is my dropping table test, where the focal point is approximately the fourth or the fifth one in, I can't remember which, but basically we've got very deep penetration because we've got very high intensity coming through the center of the lens where the spherical aberration is worst, or in this case, best, because it produces the deepest cuts. What I'm now going to show you, and I'm gonna slide it into the background, is exactly the same shape, size of lens, except this is a gallium arsenide two and a half inch meniscus lens. Mm. I think you can clearly see the cutting ability of that lens is compromised, crap, use whatever adjective you want but it's not the sort of lens that you would use for deep cutting. I think you can see that very clearly. All I can do is show you the proof. You can choose to believe it or not. Go ahead and do the test yourselves. Let me just step back a second and say, what about engraving? Well, engraving is not any different to cutting. We need to set the power of the machine lower. And as we reduce the power of the machine, what we should be doing, we should be changing the shape of the beam and making it blunter. And if we make the beam blunt, it means that we won't be using the full extent of this red projection. We should be pulling everything backwards to make it a much softer beam. And so we won't get as much cutting during our engraving process. So I think I've reached a point where I don't need to destroy any more lenses. I've already proved that if you take the center away from a lens, you can destroy its cutting ability. And when you look at my diagrams, you can see why, because that's where the power of cutting exists. It isn't necessarily a focus below the focal point that defines the cutting ability of a lens, although it is a contributor. 
it is the the strange non-Gaussian mode burn that happens below the focal point, which is actually responsible for the cut that we produce in materials. So the longer the focal length, the deeper you can cut, but you either have to go slower or have a slightly more powerful laser tube to achieve it faster. But again, there is a physical limitation even on a four inch lens as to how deep you can go I should be limited by my 70 watts of power. So in the next session, I think what I should be doing is looking at that four inch lens to see whether or not I can make it cut deeper than the two and a half inch lens where I was able to achieve 26 millimeters at three millimeters a second. Can I achieve 50 millimeters at one millimeter a second with a four inch lens with my 70 watts? Interesting. So thank you very much for your patience and uh, I'll see you in the next session.